This is The Lonely Office, your playbook for navigating the messy line between work and life. Our topics are sourced from real anonymous workplace conversations happening within Glassdoor communities. From AI taking white collar jobs to talking politics at work, we discuss timely work life issues so you don't have to brave the professional world alone. So we're going to hear about Logan, the paralegal. Yeah. Logan (laughs) was working for a law firm for two years and he noticed that he was getting his work done a lot quicker since he went remote. Logan has an income of $50,000 and he begins to wonder if with a bit of savvy and AI at his side, he could double his earnings and hit six figures by taking on another full-time job. (laughs) Oof, okay. He started his search discreetly, applying only to fully remote positions in different states to avoid any overlap with his current firm. He also made sure that the companies he applied to were not competitive to his current firm. Mm -hmm. On his weekly Zoom check-ins with his supervising associate, he tried really hard to remain calm and inconspicuous. He didn't want to raise any suspicions. He's covering his footprints. (laughs) Logan felt like he was leading a double life, almost like he was having an affair. It's stressful. Despite these doubts, he conquered them and scored the second job. He was offered a full-time paralegal position that, combined with his current job salary, would push his earnings over the 100K mark. Six figures. He felt like he hit the jackpot. (laughs) This new job finally comes along. A Zoom meeting was set up with HR and the new associate he'd be reporting to. Logan smiled for the camera. The green light turns on. But then Logan's face turns white as a ghost. He thought, (laughs) did I show up to the wrong job? Because staring right back at him was the supervising associate, his freaking boss from the original job. (laughs) Oh, he's caught. No joke. Logan's mind is racing. He considered abruptly turning the camera off and then fabricating (laughs) an emergency. Yeah, that's what I would do, by the way. I would fabricate (laughs) an emergency for sure. (laughs) Just shut the laptop. (laughs) Then something truly extraordinary happened. If what I just told you wasn't extraordinary enough. His boss remained silent and also shaken. Mm. He goes, welcome to our firm. We're so glad to take this exciting journey with you. Oh! (laughs) Logan realized the shocking truth. His boss was having a corporate affair as well. (laughs) No way this is true. This is outrageous. I don't buy it. What kind of world are we living in here, Matt? It seems like stranger than fiction, right? Oh, man. This is beyond fiction. This is like a Kafka book of absurdity. (laughs) As our listeners know, these are real threads. We're going into the Glassdoor communities. I guess we check out Reddit a bit too. And it really makes you wonder how prevalent this really is. Leah, in the marketing side, before we kind of kick off here, is this phenomenon something you're familiar with? Well, I wonder if people would even tell me. I don't really know. I know there was always conversation that our developers, like the coders, were doing this. Mm. I've done marketing embed work where I'm still employed by the agency, but I'm also working for one of our clients where I'm literally working at both companies at the same time. It's hard work. Mm. And that was above board. That wasn't sort of the having an affair That was a sanction stepping outside of my marriage, (laughs) my job marriage, so to speak. Just to kind of share a personal story in this regard, too. There's a word that I used to hear only on occasion in tight corporate circles three years ago. But now I feel the word has leaked through and entered the everyday parlance of white collar America. That word is fractional. Fractional. Yeah, fractional. Talk about absurdity. My encounter with the word was around three years ago when I was pitched a fractional CEO role by an agency. They just advocated that I split myself into thirds or quarters, as I was (laughs) told, and you'll get paid two, maybe three full-time salaries. When I first heard it, it just sounded too good to be true. Since then, three years later, I've come across pretty much every job title that exists in a corporate organization with the same word fractional abutted to it. So you have fractional CTOs, fractional CMOs, fractional project managers, fractional advisors, fractional HR. It's just everywhere. It's gotten to the point where I even have like a close colleague of mine who's an entrepreneur. He's launched a startup platform dedicated to this trend. What? His website unabashedly proclaims the best people already have jobs. (laughs) Hire them fractionally. That could be 
true. It could be true. And I think it's easy to understand culturally speaking, where all this comes from. We all consume everything digitally these days, and it all happens in bite-sized fractions. I mean, you can have political revolutions occur in a 30-second TikTok. You can have access to all this information. doesn't necessarily make us more productive or capable. And maybe let's kick off here. The sheer abundance of threads and stories we came across in Glassdoor, where people were talking about picking up two, even three full-time jobs, makes you at least consider the possibility of fractionalizing yourself, honestly, especially if you're out to net <laughs> a few extra zeros in your salary. So Leah, have you ever fractionalized yourself? I haven't, though. There's definitely periods where I was picking up work, the social media side of my life while also having a full-time job. Make me think like, am I leading a double life? Did you feel like it was a conflict of interest or anything? I mean, I always made sure it wasn't a conflict of interest, but it's just feels a little bit weird. I have a story. This was in the Wall Street Journal, and this was an anonymous report of something similar. And if I got the details right here, there was a person who was like VP of sales. And the executive vice president gives this person a call. The VP of sales had set up an office. We'll just call it the executive calls. And it's like, hey, I'd like to talk to so-and-so. And the reception is like, oh, you want to talk to some, so-and-so from this company? He's like, no, I want to talk to the person that works for my company. And the receptionist goes, oh, I'm a receptionist for both. <laughs> he works for both companies. And the guy's like, you got to be kidding me. He gets the number to the other company. He calls. And apparently this guy who is living this double life, having two full-time jobs, one receptionist just got it twisted on one call. She's screening calls and he gets fired on the same day by both companies. That's crazy. If he's doing a good job, I don't know. Mm. See, that's the thing is like, is it a problem? I know for me, I'm not capable emotionally. Listen, I love my wife. I'm monogamous, but I'm monogamous by choice for so many reasons. One of which is it's so stressful to even think <laughs> about having an affair. I would be I really in my hope head your the wife whole time. is listening to this episode. Oh. She needs to listen to this. I, I couldn't even imagine it. Where do I go? I'm lying to people. I would mix up names. I'd be sweating. I couldn't sleep at night. It's right. so emotional turmoil. <laughs> Look, if the basis of understanding is that I'm supposed to be with one company and working one job, yeah. you know, contractually or through my employer, I don't think I can do another full time job and, and have to hide it. Uh, corporate affair. Even when I was doing it and I wasn't hiding it between the two jobs, just keeping up with the emails and the calendars, it's a pain in the butt. Oh, yeah. But I mean, I guess if you're making twice as much money, it's probably worth it. Just to pick up on that thread, and before I get into another story that we we found from uh, the Glassdoor community, this comes from uh, the person who has two full-time jobs. I work eight to eight weekdays and only four of those hours overlap thanks to the time zone and lunches. Aha, uh -huh, okay. So the tip off there, if you're seriously considering doing this, different time zones help. He goes on, I honestly don't take lunch and work for the other place during my lunch. Doing this way, I'm getting weekends and holidays off. If there are meetings for one place, I book that same time for the other place so meetings don't overlap. He or she, whoever this is, fills in that slot. The point there being is ingenious. a lot of planning. You've got to be able to have function. This is not for people with ADHD. Is that really a, an affair, though? I keep using this language. When I think about Logan, Logan technically was having an affair right. because he was hiding the fact. He did everything, right? Like he planned it. It was meticulous. He made sure there wasn't competing interests. It's the same thing. Like make sure they're in different cities. He's got one lady at a hotel, the other one at a house. Like he's having this set up in a way so that he doesn't have this intersectionality. That to me is an affair. Maybe this VP of sales or even in the story you just mentioned with this time zone ninjutsu, isn't this just an open marriage? No, not unless both parties are aware and happy about it. They have to be aware. And I think in the back half of this episode, we're going to talk about some of the, if you're actually considering doing this, legal implications or might want to keep an eye out for in your employer contracts to see if this is actually <laughs> doable. Matt, you asked Leah, have you ever done something like this? Oh, yeah. Come on, Matt. Oh, this is back in my mid-20s. And I took on some consulting work under a separate LLC. And I think to Leah's point, I mean, I was pretty capable and both sides were very happy. And I didn't even have to formally tell the employer because it was just another contract job, right? It wasn't a full-time job. And I'd already reviewed the employer contract and it didn't have an issue with that. That's more complicated. But what I have done, 
the moonlighting on a startup thing, which is a different type of affair, which is also legally kosher yeah. as far as you're not intruding on your mm. full-time job, right? I know a few people who have done that, and I get that it's technically kosher, but i be tough if you felt like your employee wasn't fully engaged, and then you find out it's because they're completely committed and engaged to their own thing. I hear you. I actually experienced on both sides because with the startups I end up building and growing, I'm very hyper-conscious of my own employees of, are they launching anything? And I've taken usually the approach of being very open about it. I fully expect everyone who gets employed by one of my startups to launch their own thing. So more power to you, but I just try to keep them engaged and happy and challenged so that maybe they never actually have time to do it. (laughs) I will say I do have a friend who he was saying his big concern is that his work-life balance currently is great because he can get his current job done in like 20 hours a week. And then he spends the rest of the time doing this part-time job that he's very passionate about and spending time with his family. He was like, every job I've ever worked, the people around me are talking about, I'm so overwhelmed. I've got so much to do. I just can't manage it. I can't balance it all. He was like, and I've never felt that way. I'm like, you might just be better at your job and more efficient. We do live in a time now where the dual forces of remote work And artificial intelligence, it is real. When they interplay with one another, they really do trek a path towards becoming more productive in real ways where maybe this double timing, triple timing becomes achievable, particularly with engineers, but honestly now even marketers, creators. So we should talk about that. But before we do, so speaking of marital disputes, in this story, there's a Seattle executive who happens to be a technical executive, or so the company thought. Around three years or so into his gig, apparently there was some strife at home with his wife, a marital dispute. And the employer got called by the wife professing that her husband was a fraud, that he had no technical degree whatsoever. He wasn't even an engineer. And that in fact, he was subcontracting any technical workout <laughs> to engineers in India. <laughs> so of course the company is like, wow. we got to get to the bottom of this. So the story goes on oh my gosh. and they set up this mid-level executive on a project where basically he couldn't hit bullshit his way through it. He had to take on some direct technical oversight uh, in a short time period. And uh-huh. he was out. In this scenario, it's not quite double timing, but yeah. similar in that as far as the engineer is outsourcing his own job. That's just straight wow. up fraud. Come on. <laughs> Aaron, you seem devastated by that one. To be honest with you, and maybe this will call my character into Uh-oh. question. That's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> Ultimately, was the work good? This is where the gray area is. You're right. On its surface, when you say that you're doing a job, you're doing a job. And I get that. And that's important. But at the end of the day, from a deliverable standpoint, if you're the employer, ultimately, it does it really matter if the work is good? Hey, I just want to interrupt really quick. If you're enjoying this show, please leave us a review and a five-star rating. Just takes- Aaron, 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 yeah. that's asking too much. It's asking it, it's just much. a couple seconds. Yeah. Just a couple seconds, literally two. It actually takes okay, less ra- time than me saying this right now. Five-star rating. Five-star, Five-star rating. rating. And listen, we couldn't do this without your support, sincerely. All right, let's get back to it. The only rebuttal, honestly, I could think of at all, Aaron, to that is if the company is hiring this person as an investment in that person with the expectation of them moving up the ranks, that person ultimately is going to be managing technical reports You can't outsource management, right? Well, you could get some fractional support. (laughs) I feel like you've shifted my perspective on this because if you think about it, how often do companies outsource work and they aren't fully forthcoming with the client about it? And also how often are you as an employee outsourced to somebody at a much higher hourly rate than you're actually getting paid. Things are crumbling around me now. I don't know. (laughs) Well, no, speaking of that crumbling, I had a couple of people reach out to me. They have been part of these layoffs in the tech and media space. And they told me, you know, there's all this talk about the investment in us as humans. At the end of the day, when they're firing us, it's bottom line. I'm not trying to villainize anybody. I'm saying at the end of the day, when a company needs to make decisions for cost cutting for business, I totally get that, right? So why is it then that when an employee uses that same kind of mentality, I'm not saying outright fraud and deception. I'm not clearly not advocating this. I'm just saying if they are using subcontractors or they're doing something to be able to get more done or have two full-time jobs, why does that matter? I think your point about your colleagues of yours, your friends, 
and the layoffs speaks to the impulse that may be causing more and more professionals, namely white collar professionals, to adopt this corporate affair. If you're a white collar professional, particularly now, right, where the writing is on the wall, white collar professionals are looking over their shoulder, looking at their blue collar peers and they're like, I saw how it ended up there in the manufacturing industry. Yeah, we're not going to risk it. This is the white collar professional's way of dealing with the economic automation and outsourcing that happened historically with blue collar workers. And it's just a natural progression. It started with, I don't trust the company. I'm going to be leaping after a year to now. Well, forget the stint. I'm just going to double timing. I'm going to take on two, three jobs at the same time. It's a survival of the impulse that may be causing some of this with the white collar professional. You do have to wonder how someone doesn't notice that the person doesn't right. have a full workload or is fully working one or two other jobs. Well, the wife notices, right? But here's <laughs> yeah. another story that could actually help elucidate that point a bit. This one from another thread. I'll just read it out. One source code engineer recently wrote that he had two jobs, one of which pays $200,000 a year, which takes up about 15 hours of his time. And another, which pays around $95,000 a year, which takes up a sum total of zero hours. <laughs> not quite sure how that happens. I'm not sure if they even know I'm here anymore. The source code engineer said, I'm a source code engineer, some shit they made up, and I'm supposed to manage the source code uploaded by devs. But the problem is the team I work with hasn't uploaded <laughs> anything in months. I've gotten a total of 13 emails in three months, 10 of which were automated. Oh, <laughs> the programmer was recently debating getting a third job. To your point, Leah, it's negligence that these companies don't know this is going on. And we're not here to isolate engineers. I'm sure like we have engineer listeners who are like giving away the tricks of the trade here. Don't ruin it for us. Look, it's going on in other places. You know, we heard, just heard the story of Logan and that legal industry, right? And the VP of sales as well. Or VP the, of sales. That guy. Yeah. Let me speak to the question where we're talking about Logan here. Really, the end of the story isn't about the fact that he can't deliver for the second job. It's just the fact that this boss that's from the other job is doing the same thing. So one thing to consider right. from a quality standpoint is if done right, in some cases, it could be really beneficial. I would say for me in my own consulting space, Matt, you were talking about the AI tools in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Utilizing those tools to eliminate a lot of the monotonous first draft work I was doing has actually allowed for a deeper relationship with my clients. I guess what I'm saying is there's a case to be made when done correctly and ethically that this could really totally. be a good thing. And we just need to start kind of agreeing on the rules. We are at a point in time where a lot of these productivity gains are real and maybe it's quite acceptable and almost beneficial if you were to ask me 12 months ago, I would be a little baffled by all this, honestly. I can't understand how more productivity could be squeezed in a jam-packed day simply through the process of self-division. Like, you're going to fractionalize myself, but like, how, right? That, there's, the math doesn't work. But since 12 months, AI has made a huge leap forward, along with like the acceptance and resignation of remote, those dual forces are real. From some of the AI tools that are out there, a lot of our white-collar workers listening to this, they're probably thinking of, oh, okay, GPT-4 and, you know, whatever, Bard and Gemini. Now, like there are actually applications out there that are specific to the legal industry. I know my wife, partially because I developed the application with a few engineers, she was able to really dramatically increase and enhance her job too. And so the point is, is that these AI gains are real. And I think the blurring of the line between the 1099 contractor and the full-time employee, that's going to become the precedent. So I think I've mentioned on here before that I have a friend who he's able to code different applications to run to make his job more efficient. Right. Scripts. Scripts. Yeah. Thank you. Like when you receive an email requesting a report, the report is automatically generated and emailed back without <laughs> basically him having to do anything. But when he was very honest with his employer about the fact that he was doing this and saying like, you know, you guys could implement this other places, you know just more work was piled on top of him. <laughs> so instead of getting to enjoy the benefit of becoming more efficient and the company Expected essentially that. punished for it. So I, the first time I came across the term fractional support was I was on a client call and they introduced me to their fractional CMO. And I had never heard about this. Oh, really? Someone was like, yeah, I'm a fractional CEO. I'm Googling <laughs> fractional CEO. I'm like, what the hell is a fractional CEO? And discovered what we just talked about, which is it's essentially a freelancer with these set of skills. Maybe they had a baseline of five to 10 years at X company. And now they just freelance out certain segments of their time to however many clients they can handle. 
it may be in a new normal. Is it going to be employers that say, hey, we don't need to have affairs anymore. We understand. We're open to the fact that you can work as a 1099. You just have to do these things. I think we're already seeing employees make the first move. And just to be more specific, we're not talking about 1099 contractors. We're talking about full-time roles where to involve benefits and you know different tax withholding procedures by the company. And that's where some of the complexities come in here that you want to be aware of. If you're thinking about this or you've already engaged in it, you want to review your employer contract and check specifically for any exclusivity clauses or non-compete clauses. Those would be the obvious areas to start to see if the employer had already precluded you, legally at least, from taking on other full-time jobs. The exclusivity one is a little more direct, basically saying your full-time employment is exclusive to us. The non-compete is indirect because it's basically implying that, yeah, you might be able to take on a job, but it can't be for competitive reasons. So perhaps if a full-time job was outside the industry altogether, right, maybe you can do it. There's also clauses, you know, I came across real quick, which are actually require full-time attention to the job. So they're they're super Uh, specific. Like Ah. I said, what's so interesting is you now have third-party companies launching that support the employee in this regard. So that particular company from my colleague I mentioned, I won't mention the company's name, he actually will review the employer contract for you to Ah. see if if it's To allow for that fractional support possibility. Yeah, exactly. The other one is oh, conflict okay. of interest. Logan, mm-hmm. I guess he was very careful covering his footprint. His like, I'm going to work, yeah, like non-competitive <laughs> law firms, right? So you want to be very conscious of the conflict of interest part in as far as the companies competing with one another. And if they're even in the same industry, you can could claim potentially that there's a conflict of interest there. And then lay you hit upon the tax and insurance issues. For those of us who are married, you might have primary insurance that you're covered through yourself and then secondary insurance through your spouse. What's interesting in a scenario where you have two jobs, it's no longer a function of you and your spouse. It's like you yourself may have a primary insurance for one job and a second insurance you designate secondary with another job. In both those cases, you're required to inform the insurance company that like one is a secondary, the other is a primary in order for it to work. There's just these like little complexities you have to deal with tax withholding, like you might be under withholding or over withholding with two jobs. So you want to make sure you navigate that. In one of the previous episodes, you inspired me, Matt, to pull up my contract. Right. And I did it again. And I don't think, this is an old contract from a few years ago. I don't think there's anything in it saying that I can't, but if I wanted to go get a job, I don't know, in HR somewhere, apparently I could do it. I don't think companies were thinking about this as much just a few years ago. Maybe employers will react now and you will see these clauses included in more and more contracts. And maybe employees saying no to the job offers. What do you think happens to Logan and the boss? Do you think they just both continue to work efficiently in this way? Or is it something where they go, you know what, this is too much mentally? I feel like they sidebar and in the end, it's actually better for them. Yeah. They're on the same page. They can make sure their schedules Incentives are aligned, align yeah. between the two roles. If someone's listening now and they're on the fence, any words of wisdom... I would just say, you better be an amazing compartmentalizer, whatever if that's a word. Like, you better have an amazing ability to compartmentalize if you need to do that, because it's not just the tasks that you're compartmentalizing, different mental drawers of yours. It's also just like the emotion associated with each job, with each relationship, right? Oh. Like, the, maybe you mix the relationships and you're speaking with one manager, but you're thinking you speak to the other manager and just like, so oh my goodness. A, a fair analogy, Aaron, that you introduced is kind of a, a fair analogy. It's like, a corporate affair sort. So I would just say, document your tracks and take it very diligently. When you were talking about being able to compartmentalize and jump from sort of client to client, boss to boss, there are industries where people do that anyway. Like law is obviously one of them. You're working on different cases. You have to keep those things separate. It's true with ad agencies. We've got different clients and different projects. And I'm not going to get a second job before anyone listening to this. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> jumps to any unfair conclusions. If there's anything I learned from this episode and story is that I'm a one woman man. I love you, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hey, you made it. Thanks for tuning in to The Lonely Office. If you like what you heard, follow us on all major podcast platforms so you don't miss an episode. And make sure and tap five stars and leave a review. I know everyone says it, but it actually helps others like you discover the show. Remember, the topics you hear us talk about on the show are sourced from Glassdoor communities, where professionals are having candid conversations about their careers anonymously with others in their industry. To be part of that conversation, download the Glassdoor app. And when you're in the app, make sure and join the Lonely Office Bowl. That's where we are. When you're there, you can suggest a topic idea or an episode idea, or you can make it more formal and email us at thelonelyoffice at glassdoor.com. We'll catch you next time. 